and type your question in there and then hit submit and um, we'll be able to read that off here and answer them. And again, the purpose is on the uh, health home application, uh, anything on the resource document, or the health home rule. And I did email uh, the pr uh, PowerPoint presentation to everybody about 10 after 1. Uh, if you were registered by then, you would have received this. If not, we can send the PowerPoint uh, after that, I do. I did find out after last week the um, the actual email that I sent out didn't go through until I think four four thirty. So I apologize for that. I'm not sure what was the holdup. Okay. Um, the first one, this slide here, because the next couple of questions. Uh, this is page two of the application, and this slide. Uh, shows and highlighted a couple of things that the next questions will be about. So I had a little bit more time this week and thought I'd try to get that into the PowerPoint. And the questions, this is under the um, behavioral and physical health integration section. Okay. And the first question we've gotten is what is meant um, applicants uh, with fully integrated ownership or membership interest model to attach a copy of your agency service plan or program description for primary care service? And we've been asked what really is meant by the, um, that program description or service plan. And this is really similar to any other types of um, documents, descriptions you do for services, such as counseling or CPST. When an organization does that, it's a requirement of the Department of Mental Health. It's a requirement of the accrediting body is that you put forth a description of it. And you might put in here your hours of operation, you know, describe perhaps a little bit in broad detail about your staffing uh, model, capacity for same-day appointments, next-day appointments, um, acute chronic care. It's basically the description of the primary care services that your organization has provided. Given if you're doing an ownership membership model, then this is a service that you've uh, chosen to make available. Then we've also gotten a question. Um, the application um, asks for applicants, if you're doing coordinated and co-located, to attach a copy of your agreement with primary care providers. And some organizations have asked about um, or perhaps thought that if a consumer is going to continue to see his or her own primary care physician, that they needed to enter into an agreement um, with all of the different physicians, you know, and this could be 10, 20, 50, depending on how large your organization is. That's not what this is talking about. Um, as part of providing health home service, uh, the health home service provider needs to either, um, has to provide integrated behavioral health, physical health services. And they can do that in one of two ways, through an ownership membership model, as we just talked about, and that's where um, the health home service provider itself is providing physical health care services or through a coordinated co-located model. And in that you do it by an agreement with another provider or providers of primary care services. That is part of a service that your organization is providing. In the health home rule, it does say that there's, there's nothing in the rule you can't make a consumer receive behavioral health services or primary care services from your organization. So um, if a consumer already has their own physician, they want to keep seeing um, their own physician, in a lot of cases or most cases that would be the case, that's fine. You don't need to have an agreement with all of those different physicians. What you would want is um, something in place your, um, through your outreach and your other information that you can exchange data. There's requirements for you know, some of the information that providers have to report on vitals and other information. You may be getting that from a primary care physician. So, but to be clear, this is not an agreement with every primary care provider who sees every consumer that has one on your caseload. 
you know, question not on here, questions come up in the past, well, what if the consumer wants to participate in health home service, they have their own primary care provider, and that primary care provider isn't willing to uh, exchange information, the consumer isn't willing to sign a release of information. Um, it is, if a consumer wants to participate in health home service, if they're going to be seeing um, their own primary care physician outside of the uh, service that's available and offered through the health home, but if they don't want the health home to be able to receive information and share information back and forth with their personal primary care provider, then they really can't participate in the health home service. That is one of the requirements of health home service. And when you're talking with, if um, maybe through the orientation uh, and the consent that's done with the consumer, that might be a time to discuss that. Got the question, if uh, in some providers, the multiple locations, maybe different health home locations in different counties, and they might be doing uh, ownership membership at one site and at another site that they're doing, uh, providing it through an integrated care agreement. So the question was asked, do they have to submit multiple applications? No. And um, just you, on page three, it talks in the table, and if you're implementing different integrated care models, just make additional copies of this table as needed. So in that case, you would submit both a copy of your primary care service description or agency service plan, as we just talked about two slides ago. You would attach a copy of your integrated care agreement, um, and then you would make additional copies of the table. Care coordination. Um, about there's the communication plan. This is on page six. It requires uh, ask you to um, attach that. Let's see if I can get over to that real quickly. I didn't get that screenshot in. So right there under there uh, under C uh, one in the second bullet point, it asks you to attach your communication plan and to address the routine exchange of information. So the question is, is there a specific template? Is there a format? Are we looking at the supervisor reporting hierarchy? Do we prefer a sentence format? Providers have the flexibility to develop their own format. Now, this is talking about the communication plan. And I want to go back to that screenshot there under care coordination. Uh, and if I knew how to use the pen on this, I would circle it. But under C1, the first bullet point says attach your communication protocols or policy that describes. That, that's what your organization's putting in place, how you function, what are your protocols, what are your policies and procedures. This communication plan that is asked for, this is developed with the consumer and identifies the entities and pers uh, persons with which the health home is going to routinely communicate. Routinely is one of the key parts there information, data to be exchanged, and talk about frequent, uh, the frequency. So for example, when you're sitting down with the consumer and you're identifying the different persons, um, maybe, again, as I just talked about, a consumer might choose to keep um, providing, um, keep their own primary care provider. That's going to be one person that you see on this communication plan. They have a specialty care provider. They may want to involve uh, their spouse, a significant other a guardian, anybody that um, is part of the whole coordination of care with this provider, you're going to identify it on the communication plan. So you're going through this with the consumer, listing the people and what is the information. And some it might be test results. Maybe it's a you know, pharmacy uh, and talking about whether or not the person gets uh, refills their prescriptions. Plan, plan, care plan, anybody. Care plan, sharing the care plan, clinical, and summaries. clinical summaries, and so that might be um, somebody asked a question last week that thought it was monthly. It, it could be monthly if you choose that. It could be every other month. It, you know, it could be every three months. You know, there's different information there, and so you're going to individualize that based upon the needs of the consumer. Got a question, will we conduct an on-site survey as a routine part of the health home service certification process? 
Then the application needs to demonstrate your ability and readiness to, to provide health home service, and it's going to demonstrate compliance with the health home service requirements. We've had questions about how do you submit the attachments? Is there a format um, that we're asking for? And we've been asking um, an organization submit the entire agency policy and procedure manual. So I'd like to show it. On page one of the application, it does state to please label all attachments that you submitted with the appropriate application section title and number. And for example, I was just showing like on the um, page six under the care coordination, C1, and there's uh, two attachments there, your communication uh, policies and protocols back there, and then your communication plan. So you would label those C1, uh, both of those C1. So if an organization wants to provide its entire uh, policy and procedure manual, it can do so. I uh, would not recommend it. It's going to slow down the process. And But if doing so, they would need to go in, and in every place in the policy and procedure manual, would have to clearly identify um, you know, the parts of the application to which it's responding. Then I want to let everybody know, as uh, we've talked about in different trainings, we, have, uh, we are revising the health home rule. Tomorrow, we'll be filing that uh, with JCAR. There's a public hearing that's tentatively scheduled for August 16th. And there on that slide, I have the link to a rules listserv. And if you would like to sign up on that listserv, you'll get notified of any communications that are related to rule activities, rule filing, uh, draft rule available to, um, for comment, rule training. It, we automatically send, otherwise we automatically send the notifications out to um, agency executive directors. And that is the last slide there. I'm trying to get. That's the, the, the last slide that we have, uh, slide that we have. Afet, do you have anything you wanted to say before you, in particular before you run off, or should I go into the questions? No, I think the first uh, section that you covered, the list of questions around uh, uh, primary care, behavioral health integration, um, I just received a question. One provider was wondering um, if the agreement, uh, integrated care agreement, needs to be with like an FTHC, like an organization, or does it have to include each individual primary care physician at that agency? Uh, the answer is, uh, we are looking for an organization level agreement. That means from agency to agency. So between your agency and FKC or a primary care practice, uh, that should be the agreement. You should not have an individualized agreement with every single primary care physician or provider at an FKC or, or at a, a primary care practice. Uh, it should be between the organizations, um, not between individual um, uh, providers in the home phone. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the questions that have been submitted in writing. And again, if you would like to just type them in. Um, on the page for the application, the primary care screening assurance checklist wants information regarding screenings that are not required items for use per the clinical performance measures. Do we still need to gather this information for children and adolescents? I'm trying to get. Apologize for it. We're having a little computer freeze. So they're up on the, the screen. Everybody should be able to see. That's what the question is about, the primary care screening assurance checklist. And again, the question was it's asking for uh, readings that aren't required for use, and do you still need to gather that information? If something, um, I'm not sure, reading through some of the, uh, let me go back to the question. Let me see, um, vitals, current medications, um, tobacco, drug, alcohol use, 
frequency and amount, those are all um, could be applicable, should be applicable. If it's something on the performance measure that's not required for use, then if, um, and if it's not applicable, then you wouldn't be collecting it. But if it is something, you know, for example, if you've um, cancer screenings, and if you're um, a child and adolescent team, you know, and you've got you know, children, you might not be doing mammogram or pap test or that. So if it's, if it's not applicable to actually perform those screenings um, for, the, for the individual, regardless of the age or based upon the sex, then you wouldn't be collecting the data. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for the application itself, uh, just to clarify for everybody that, uh, that you need to check yes to all those assurances. Um, not, uh, I guess uh, failure to check yes to or provide assurance uh, may result in um, you know, um, uh, certain delays in your certification process. Um, but in terms of the collection, um, that, you know, making sure that uh, uh, whoever is the primary care provider is paying attention to those basic screening, primary care screening and treatment, and, and providing care in accordance with the standards of primary care uh, profession. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of what, what is required in that, not necessarily for you to be collecting all that data and reporting. Uh, you don't have to, but your primary care uh, you know, partner or if you're the primary care provider, you need to make sure that these screenings and treatment activities are happening because these are the standards of care uh, for primary care. And then you need to make sure the health and population is receiving uh, care that is at the standard, not substandard. Uh, there's a question here on um, how an agency would know if a uh, client or new client is eligible for health home service. Hopefully, people were able to attend the webinar that was last Wednesday on July 10th um, to talk about the de-identified um, population data that was released. If people weren't able to attend it, that is available on the department's website um, uh, for people to go look at it there. Oops, sorry. Uh, getting a little click happy here. So um, we're not, and there will be, one of the things that was mentioned is that there will be future webinars to answer, you know, sort of more questions about uh, moving forward. So you'll want to look for that uh, future webinar and that question there. There's a question on uh, the health home service rule. How much health home, how much face-to-face -face contact is, um, with the clients is being expected? Uh, and how much indirect or non-face-to-face -face time is expected per client. Um, there is no, you know, in the rule, there are no requirements. So there's nothing in the health home rule that it doesn't talk about a minimum of, you know, once a month face-to-face, -face, three times a month. You, if you're providing the service in that month, you have to provide an eligible health home service. Uh, there's a question, is, is health home is standalone, is there a need for co-location? Um, if, Mike, if I understand you correctly, you're saying perhaps if you have a health home service provider that uh, by standalone, if you mean that they're providing the integrated uh, care, the physical health care component through ownership or membership, um, is there a need for co-location? We're not specifying where that would be. Um, they might be providing it also at their own agency, or they might have it at another location. If uh, there's a question about that table A, if providing the same uh, model at all locations, is uh, do you have to complete that more than once? So screen, screen went black there. Uh, no. If you have the same, and I've got that slide back up, So if you're doing it the same way, then you only have to fill that table out once. Some more questions here. There's a question about, please clarify which performance monitoring report is needed, employee performance or, 
your staff performance. Um, what the, the question is, um, the reference to the performance measures, those are part of the state plan amendment that's approved by CMS. Those are the uh, quality performance measurements. They are not in the, they are not in the rule. The rule ref, there is a reference to them in the rule, but they are not located in the rule. And that's part of the requirements for CMS to approve the to approve it. Um, has there been a um, there hasn't been an updated? Um, I know they're posted yeah. on the website. So if yeah. I can get over there pretty quickly, we'll we'll see. Yes, we reduced the number of uh, required art, uh, performance measures for phase two. I believe that now we only have a, a total of 19 performance measures, which is a reduction from 27 or 28 from phase one. Um, and we listed the uh, phase two performance measures and the methodology for each measure on our website. Now you should be able to see it on your screen. Um, uh, Janelle uh, uh, pulled it up. So this gives you the, each uh, measure definition and the methodology uh, and all the technical um, specifications and definitions um, uh, how it's going to be all, uh, measured. So um, that will be a good resource. But we hope to have a, a webinar, uh, uh, you know, devoted to just uh, performance measures and, 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 you know, do an overview on that in the future. And you can get to that link under Featured News on the Ohio Medicaid Health Home News page. Page, page 9, number 4, attach a sample of your performance monitoring report. Oh, that's the one I just read. I have, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I think when I just read that, I need to, um, I missed part of that. Go back to page nine here. Page nine, number four. All right, that's the right page. Okay, yeah, I'm, and I'm, I apologize, I'm not seeing that on page nine. So if you want to provide some. If you want to clarify that, then I'll try to, I'll try to get back to that question. I apologize. Another question about eligibility for service. And again, I, if you did not participate in the webinar last week, I would encourage you to go um, listen to that webinar. So uh, Joe asked a follow-up question to um, on the routine screenings that are on page four of the application. It sounds like we're saying we should check yes to assure, but reality may not have to collect and report things that are not relevant for kids. Is this correct? And that question, again, going back to And I think, Joe, what you're, what you're asking is, um, do you collect yes on it if it's, I'm sorry, do you check yes? to show that you have the capacity to do so, but you don't have to collect and report things that aren't relevant for kids. Right. Correct. Page two, the last part of the last part of integrated care model, health home and primary care. Clarify what the application means by current capacity and how it is appropriate and feasible for service population. Are they speaking towards how the business model is appropriate and feasible for the service population, how the capacity is feasible, et cetera? Let's go over to page two. Okay. So it's, um, that question is up on uh, number B, uh, right under B, the second paragraph. 
it says to include the following in your response, the six levels of care, your rationale, current capacity, how it's appropriate and feasible for the service uh, population. Okay, so now I'm going to... Uh, yeah, it's you know it's talking about yes how your um, how the model what you have what you have set up the integrated care if you're doing it through ownership or membership how that is going to fit your service population that you've designated if it's through integrated care agreement it might be um, you know in terms of assuring the capacity to to meet the needs of your population so it goes back to identifying, defining who your service population is, and developing uh, your model to meet those needs. Is it required that the agency report on all 19 performance measures, or can we pick or choose a certain number? Uh, they'll, as, uh, we talked about they'll have another webinar, but my understanding, um, and this is outside of this, this is outside of the rule, that you have to provide all of them that would be applicable. So in the case of where if it's not applicable based upon your age, the age of your population, you wouldn't need to, but you cannot pick and choose. And again, those are, um, those are required by the federal government um, and part of the state plan ag agreement. There's, I believe, seven or nine that CMS requires, and then states can uh, add in the additional ones, and that all becomes part of the package that CMS approves for um, approving health home services and Medicaid eligible service. So page 10, so we're going to go back to that. I think we're just looking on page 12 is on page 10. Okay. So that question before about um, attach a sample of your performance monitoring report, and I apologize, I completely uh, misunderstood that question before. Is that your employee performance or your staff performance? That is under quality improvement and performance measures and outcomes, and that's a reference to your organization's performance improvement activities um, that it has together. So we're not talking specifically about how, do, you know, Janelle's, um, you know, employee performance evaluation or that, but these are about the performance improvement activities. You know, as part of um, health home service, you should be incorporating health home service into performance improvement um, activities of your organization. Obviously, we've been talking about the performance measures that CMS requires. So it's demonstrating uh, the capacity to do that. Follow-up to PCP agreement is an agreement also required with a dental practice and an eye care practice. Okay. And then there's there's a couple of different things that you have here in, as part of the health home rule. And we'll go back to page two. This is talking about your behavioral and your physical health integration. And that's demonstrating your uh, capacity to provide physical health care services in addition to the behavioral health services that your organization's already been provided. And you can do that, as we talked about, one of two ways, ownership, membership, or through agreement. And, you know, if a client presents to your organization, you have a client uh, that they present to your organization, they don't have their own physical uh, primary care provider, they haven't seen a doctor in six years, and you talk to them about it, do they want to participate in health home service? Yes, they do. They need to see a doctor. And how are you, you as an organization, as a health home service provider, need to have arrangements in place. So you're going to either have your own physicians or through that um, co-located or coordinated model, maybe you've got co-located and you can walk them down the hall and they can see a physician in 30 minutes. Or you can get an appointment to see you've got an integrated care agreement with another provider and that's located across the street and you can get it get them an appointment the next day. That is different, and um, I think this is on, we've got the partner provider outreach and engagement. Okay. Those are, those, um, and, and dental is one of the, 
one of the, I, well, I'm not sure if it's still one of the performance measures and if and a FET has left, so I can't, uh, we don't even want to get into that discussion, but dental care, it's talked about on page, um, uh, that previous page, dental is, um, annual routine dental examination is there on the application. I believe it's still on the performance measurements, but again, I'm not certain. That's different. This is under, um, you're as an organization that you have these, um, let me go back to your provider outreach plan, communicating with different dentists, um, eye doctors, and all of those different persons, working with your consumer to receive these services, make appointments, help them. All that's part of health home service. All that's part of outreach and engagement. But that's different, and you don't have to have an agreement. That's, um, those agreements that we've been talking about are just for the physical health care services that your organization itself is responsible to provide either directly or through agreement. So I hope I've clarified that. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. If uh, that was the, that was the last question, so I um, apologize for the difficulties at the beginning. We're trying to get these sessions recorded so that we can make them available. They haven't. Uh, we haven't really been able to do that previously. Uh, if you've been participating before, we've had some primarily audio problems, and the audio wasn't very clear, and apologize for that. I'm actually uh, doing this live from my office um, to, uh, to try to address that audio problem, and hopefully it, it is better today, I'm hoping. I don't have any text messages or, or questions right in where people can't hear. So again, um, we're going to end for today. If you want to um, participate next week, uh, feel free to register for that. If you have any questions in the meantime, go back to people have seen this slide before. Uh, Rob Nugent, uh, who couldn't be with us today, but he is the contact for all things help home related to the application or the rule itself. Again, questions about client eligibility or um, enrollment and all of that, that, was, that would be directed to the Office of Health Integration. So I hope everybody has a really great week, and thank you for participating today, and uh, perhaps uh, talk to you next week. Bye-bye.